All right, so here we are with another analytical biochemistry lecture, and this time around we're going to be talking about electrophoresis and how we can use it to separate and analyze uh, proteins and DNA mainly. Before we talk about that, why? There we go. Um, before we talk about that, I just want to point out a few things about the properties of uh, proteins mainly. So electrophoresis is mainly used for the fractionation of proteins. So we are going to be focusing a lot on proteins, but I am going to talk about uh, RNA and DNA a little bit as well. So I'll make that clear when we're, we're talking about that. So the first thing I want to point out is in a typical cell, the majority of the cell is actually water. Um, and the other 30% are these various different biomolecules. Um, and so there is quite a high percentage of proteins, RNA and DNA. Now, the next problem that we've got is that the amount of protein in sample is one thing, but also the dynamic range of concentration is another problem that we actually have to face. So what that means is that we have an enormous amount of a uh, of, of small number of proteins. So albumin is in massive abundance. This is for this diagram is for plasma. And so it's in plasma at about 70 milligrams per mil. And so at the other end of the scale, you've got these interleukins and cytokines, which are down in the picogram per mil range. So you've got this concentration range going from the concentration of this, these cytokines at tens of copies per cell to the copies up here where it's 10 to the power of 10. 95% of the mass of serum is only 20 proteins. So being able to see these small interleukins and cytokines through the massive concentration of those 20 proteins is very, very challenging. So we use electrophoresis as one method to try and reduce the complexity of a protein sample to be able to try and see some of these lower abundance molecules. So the next thing we need to talk about is actually some of the properties of proteins. And this does apply as well to uh, DNA and RNA. In the case of proteins, we've got two main properties that we can use in electrophoresis. The first one is the charge on the molecule, and the charge will vary with pH. So at what's called the isoelectric point of the protein, where all of the negative charges and the positive charges are balanced, the charge on this particular protein molecule is zero at a particular pH. Um, if we change the pH and we make it more acidic, which means that we put more, we've got more protons, more hydrogen ions in solution, we add hydrogen ions to these carboxylic acid groups, which take them from negative to neutral, and then we add uh, to these uh, amine groups another proton which makes them positive. So overall, this protein is positive, and in an electric field, it will move to the negatively charged electrode. Same if we go basic, we start removing hydrogen ions from solution, the amines become neutral, the carboxylic acids become negative. And so this particular protein would move to the positive electrode. So that's one property that we can use to separate proteins, what their charge is at a particular pH. The other thing that we can separate things on is size. Um, so we can sieve things so that we can separate large protein molecules or large protein complexes away from smaller protein molecules and, and um, protein complexes. So what is electrophoresis? So essentially, as I've just said, we can separate molecules based on their physical properties. We just talked about size and charge, which are the ones that we use in electrophoresis. And the other one is hydrophobicity, which we talked a little bit about when we talked about mass spectrometry. And hopefully it came up in the lecture that was done on chromatography. Now, electrophoresis in its most simple form is the motion of a charged particle in a uniform electric field. So something that's negatively charged will move to the positive electrode. Something that is positively charged will move to the negative electrode. 
It's been around for a really long time, so just over 200 years this effect has been observed. And it actually won, this bloke, the Nobel Prize in 1948. It enables you to separate molecules by size or by charge or by both sequentially. So DNA and protein are both biomolecules that can be charged. So DNA is negative due to the, phospho, uh, the phosphate groups um, on the backbone of the DNA molecule. So it is negatively charged in solution. But proteins, depending on their sequence and depending on the pH of the solution, they can, all, they can be either positive or negative or neutral. So uh, just looking at DNA, uh, looking a bit further at this, um, so here we have those negatively charged phosphate groups on the background. Um, at the majority of pHs, they are always going to be negative. So DNA electrophoresis is relatively simple. These things will move towards the positive electrode. In proteins, there are many groups that then can become either positively or negatively charged. So things with a carboxylic acid side, side chain can be either negative or neutral. Ones with a primary amine or a secondary amine in their side chain, they can either be positive or neutral. And uh, some things like histidine can also be positive at certain uh, pHs. So you can do electrophoresis in just liquid. And we will talk about that a little bit later on. But the best way to do electrophoresis is actually in a matrix called a gel. And a gel is essentially a cross-linked polymer through, which has um, a whole lot of holes in it. And you can design the size of those holes. And so the liquid that can carry the molecules and carry the uh, the electric field can move through that polymer. If we don't put any electric field on or we don't apply any force, those molecules will just diffuse out um, looking for equilibrium like they normally do. Um, so they'll just start to diffuse away from their position. If we apply an electric force, those molecules will move depending on their charge. The buffer solution that is surrounding and in the gel provides the ions so that you can provide the current to get these proteins to move because the proteins and the DNA are ions. They are also charged molecules, but you need buffer ions to be able to help carry the current through the gel. If you don't have any current, you can't generate any force, and if you can't generate any force, you can't perform electrophoresis. So the first one we're going to talk about is the simplest one, which is agarose. So agarose is actually a, um, uh, a polymer of a, uh, from the, uh, isolated from a red algae, and you can buy it in a bottle, and you can make it up in a buffer solution, and you can melt it and then cast it into a particular shape. The other one, and this is mainly used for DNA molecules because DNA relative to protein is really, really big. The other alternative is to make gels out of acrylamide monomers. And you can cross-link the acrylamide monomers with these cross-linkers, methylene bisacrylamide, in the presence of TMED and ammonium persulfate. And you can make these cross-linked polyacrylamide matrices. And these can absorb and um, absorb water and become hydrated. The other place where you see polyacrylamide used is actually in babies' nappies. They make it, and when it's a polyacrylamide, it's pretty inert and pretty safe. Um, you wouldn't need it, but um, it's fine for uh, babies' nappies purposes. They're dehydrated, and then when the uh, the nappy is being used and filled with urine, that water and that liquid is absorbed by the dry polyacrylamide, and it swells up, a lot like our gels do. So you can cast these in in between plates, and you can cast wells in those in the gel, and then you can load your protein mixture in the top. And you can separate it through and separate the smaller molecules are able to move through the pores a lot more easily. They get separated out from larger and larger molecules. Yep. And so in this particular case, 
the, 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 these molecules are negatively charged. We'll talk about that in a little while. And they're moving to the positive electrode that's at the bottom of the gel. Yeah, like I just said. Okay, so as I said, um, agarose is this polysaccharide polymer of galactose. It's, it's um, normally obtained from this red algae. And as I said, you can melt it, you can pour it into a tray with a comb, and uh, you can make wells that you can put your sample in. And then when you apply the electric field, these go through the gel towards the positive electrode. And as they get separated out, you can see after you stain the gel, in this case, probably with ethidium bromide, you can see the the, uh, that the bands of DNA have been separated by their size. Now you can mess around with the concentration of agarose and optimize the separation. So the higher percentage of agarose, the smaller the pores in the uh, the gel are, and um, the more that you can separate smaller pieces of DNA. And then the larger pieces of DNA don't separate out as well. So you can optimize the concentration of your agarose for whatever particular sample that you're running. You can crank the voltage up and make things move faster. Um, and uh, you can force things to move faster than they should. Uh, the only problem with running higher voltages is higher voltage means higher current, which means higher resistance. And resistance becomes heat, and heat can eventually melt gels. So you've got to be careful with that. In DNA, the migration also depends on the physical shape of the DNA. And so DNA can take on supercoiled forms, and these have a smaller area than linear forms. So this is shown here, where these are the, t the same piece of DNA, where this has been cut with an enzyme to linearize it so that it can't form that supercoiled form. So you can see, because the supercoiled form is much more compact, it can move its way through the gel polymer, through the holes in the gel, much faster than the linear ones, which are slightly larger, and their migration is hindered or retarded. You can also mess around with the buffers um, to change the ionic strength, um, and that can affect the migration. But again, if you've got too many ions in there in the buffer, you make heat and you start melting gels. So agarose gels are really good for separating things from about 1,000 base pairs to about 50,000 base pairs. For smaller pieces of DNA, you're better off using polyacrylamide. Um, and you can actually use uh, polyacrylamide gels to resolve DNA fragments that differ by a single base pair. And we're going to talk about this in um, a couple of slides. But the first thing I want to talk about is an application of electrophoresis. So before the days of next generation sequencing, um, everything and the, in, the entirety of the Human Genome Project was done by capillary electrophoresis. And so the way that that was done is that you would do a PCR reaction where you have four different reactions with the same DNA template in there. But each one of these has what's called a terminating base. And what that does is it stops the PCR reaction randomly when this gets picked up. And so when you're amplifying uh, a number of DNA fragments into millions of DNA fragments, these terminators get picked up randomly, but then you end up with this ladder of fragments um, that are all one base pair smaller. And what you can do is you can separate these out by uh, electrophoresis. Um, so what used to happen is we used to do these in really long, meter-long gels that were very, very thin. They were about Oh, probably about 0.2 of a millimeter thick um, and about a meter long. And you would have your four separate reactions and you would load them into four separate lanes. And then you would run your electrophoresis. And so what you can now do is you can see here that these are, are resolved by one base pair. And you can start at the bottom and you can work your way up and read off the sequence. So for this, in this case, you've got G, C, G, T, A, G, 
so on and so forth. And you can read the sequence off the gel. There used to be automated software that would do this for you. Um, so you've got this one base pair resolution. This was replaced by doing things in fusilica capillaries where there, there was no gel, but the um, effect is the same. The uh, DNA molecules would interact with the surface of the capillary and be separated by size as they move through the capillary. The entire human genome project was done by hundreds and hundreds of capillary sequences, all lined up in a couple of different labs around the world, um, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, the, the Terminator would be fluorescently labeled and you would measure as they came out of the capillary, the color of the fluorescence, there would be a different fluorescent tag for each of the base. And as it came through and flashed, you would the machine would go, oh, that's an A, oh, that's a T, and be able to sequence it like that. So that's DNA sequencing. People still do capillary sequencing. They do their next generation sequencing um, protocols and then to what's called fill the gaps in. Um, they often isolate a particular section of the DNA and then capillary sequence that to validate whether or not the next generation sequencing actually got it right. So now we're going to move on to protein electrophoresis because this is the majority of the electrophoresis that most people will do. If you come in to do uh, research, um, if you're working on DNA, yes, you will do a lot of agarose gels to check PCR products, to check plasmid isolations, so on and so forth. But one of the main usages of electrophoresis in a research lab uh, is to separate proteins. So we have a problem. And the problem is that a protein molecule can be positive or negative or neutral, depending on the pH. So we've got a couple of solutions to this problem. The first solution, and the one that is typically used the most, is to make all of the molecules of the protein the same charge and separate them by size. And this is what's called SDS page, sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. You can also modify this to do clear and blue native electrophoresis, which is really, really good for protein complexes. We'll come back to that at the end of the, uh, of the video. The second thing that we can do, um, which is not as common, but it does still get used quite a lot, um, is to uh, make the proteins neutral and separate them by what's called their isoelectric point, the pH at which the protein is neutral. It has no charge on it and it can't move in the electric field. And this is done by using uh, pH gradient gels. And this is called isoelectric focusing. So we're going to deal with SDS page first, which is one of the oldest forms of doing electrophoresis. Um, the original paper for doing this uh, is actually um, a paper by Langley, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So it relies on the use of this molecule here which is sodium dodecyl sulfate. It's probably one of the most used surfactants in uh, protein work. So it's an anionic detergent. So this negative charge on this sulfonate group is very, very strong. When you boil pro uh, uh, cells or protein solutions in this, the proteins get denatured out and the protein backbone, which is represented by this ribbon, will get coated by these SDS molecules. So the tail binds onto, in a hydrophobic manner, to the protein chain. And then you have these negatively charged groups hanging out where they can interact with water and help to solubilize the protein in solution. And it gives them a, a very large overall negative charge. So... Now what you can do is put it into a gel, into the into a well up here, and you can and this gel is at pH 8.8, and you can separate the proteins out by their size. So each one of these bands that you can see is a collection of protein molecules, all of the same size. You can have different protein molecules of different sequences that have exactly the same size. So this may be one protein, it could be a number of proteins. 
So Classic SDS Page was uh, developed by Ulrich Limley uh, back in the 1970s. Um, and uh, here's the paper here. At the moment, uh, when I pulled uh, this up a few days ago, it was at nearly 54,000 citations, um, which is quite high. It uses um, a buffer of tris and glycine, which I'll come back to in the next slide. And, it, and then the gel has two parts. You have the separating gel, which is a can be a gradient gel or it can be a single percentage of polyacrylamide at pH 8.8 and a stacking gel, which is only at probably 4% acrylamide at pH 6.8. Um, the both of these, uh, sorry, the tank buffer has chloride ions, which carry um, current, but it also has this glycine in it. And glycine is a zwitter ion, which means that at different pHs, it can be either charged or uncharged. So at, at pH 8.8, .8, it takes on a negative charge. What that means is that you've got your stacking gel here, which is represented in blue, where the pH in here is pH 6.8. This part of the gel is pH 8.8, .8, and the buffer is actually 8.3. When we load our protein into the top here, there's no glycine within the gel. Um, and so we load our protein in, and we turn the current on, and the protein moves out of here and into the gel. And it, when it gets pulled down, it gets stacked into a, into a single band. The glycine ions move in as well, but the pH now swaps to 6.8, and they become less negative, and therefore they move more slowly. The chloride ions, which are the green... Uh, move in front, and so they, they form the leading edge um, carrying the current. The protein SDS molecules move a little bit more slowly, and they stack together uh, as, as we move through the, what's called the stacking gel. And then the glycine is what's called the trailing iron. What happens next is that the, um, the protein molecules hit this interface where this is 4% acrylamide and this is a much higher percentage of acrylamide. And it's like kind of hitting a wall where the stuff that's at the front momentarily slows down, and, but the molecules that are behind are going the same rate. They catch up with the ones in front and they all stack into a very small piece of space before they start moving into the separating gel. So you're compressing all of the molecules of the same protein into a small piece of space, which increases the resolution. The other thing that happens is that the glycine ions are also catching up in, at this point. They move into the separating gel, which is at pH 8.8. .8. Glycine now becomes a lot more negative and it starts to move faster and it pushes past the protein molecule which pushes them more together and increases the resolution as you separate these proteins by size. Now, this is a, a reasonable example of um, what this looks like when you've done it. These are various fractions of um, extracted tick proteins um, that have been separated out by SDS Page, where you can see there's some really nice tight bands um, where these have been really well resolved. You've got some stuff which is really high abundance and there's some stuff in the gel that is affecting the band resolution and things like that. Could be due to overloading, it could be due to surfactants, who would know? Um, if you want, the SDS gels can be very, very robust, but they can also be very, very sensitive to different things such as overloading, bad pouring, other salt effects. The, this is a catalog of gels from this website. Um, so if you're ever doing electrophoresis and you come up with problems of horrible looking gels, you can always go over to here and it will give you a potential explanation as to what you did wrong. So you can optimize things more often. What most people do, because it's really, really simple, and most people cast their own gels because it's cheap, it's relatively simple to do, is they will cast a 10 or a 12% gel 
um, of just a linear gradient and they will run their sample through and that will be all they ever do. Um, you can tailor the percentage of acrylamide to optimize different separations. So if you've got a collection of really large proteins, you may just want to use a low percentage of acrylamide to resolve out these large proteins from each other, but you're going to lose the small stuff. It's actually going to run off the gel. The, on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a collection of small proteins that you want to resolve out, you'd use a much higher percentage gel all of these large proteins won't resolve from each other, but the small ones will. You can try and get the best of both worlds where you use what's called a gradient gel, where in this particular case, uh, the lower part of the gel is high percentage of acrylamide, in this case, 20% down here, and the top here is a low percentage of acrylamide. So up here, it's 4%. And you can try and expand everything so that everything is equally separated across the range of the gel. Um, so these things, yes, you can, you can cast them yourself. You can get gradient makers to do this. It's not that hard. But a lot of people, uh, they would prefer to buy uh, commercially those gradient gels to make sure that everything is reproducible. You don't necessarily need to use glycine in these gels. You're still using SDS to coat the molecules, but you can use other uh, ions instead of glycine um, to uh, change the separation. So if you're looking at really, really small proteins, uh, you should change from glycine to this molecule, tricene, uh, because if you will have noticed, I'll go back a couple of slides, things down in the lower part of the gel start to get not as well resolved and it's because they mix up in the glycine front and they don't get resolved properly. Tricene overcomes that problem. So if you're ever working on really small proteins and peptides, tricene buffers are the way to go. You've also got these other buffer systems and they were mainly developed so that the gel can be stored at neutral pH. Um, a trisglycine gel at pH 8.8, .8, it typically has a very short shelf life. If you're going to cast one, you would want to use it within three or four days uh, because the pH starts to go off. Uh, Precast gels nowadays, um, you can buy them from certain companies and they have some kind of long life formula, which means that they last for two, three years at four degrees. Um, but the other way of dealing with this is to use these Bistris systems where you, your running buffer is either mess or mops. And again, using those different buffers, you can actually change the migration pattern uh, of the proteins depending on how um, depending on the need. So now I'm going to talk about uh, isoelectric focusing. Uh, so that was all about separation by size. Now we're going to talk about separation by charge. So in this case, what we're talking about is what at what pH is a molecule neutral, where any negative charges are balanced by a positive charge. So this is the this is the ion so proteins and peptides are zwitter ions which means that they can be positively or they can have positive or negative charges in the same molecule if we lower the ph and we increase the number of hydrogen ions we can we protonate these carboxylic acid groups and make them neutral and we protonate these amine groups and we make them positive same if we go the other way, we deprotonate these and make them neutral, and we deprotonate these and make them negative. Um, I really should look ahead of my slides. And so what we can do on the protein level, this is just showing the same thing. So at neutral pH, we have the positive and uh, and um, and and negatives. In the case of the neutral molecule, these are balanced. In the case of the others, you've either got an excess of one or the other. It's normally reliant on this collection of amino acids, which are the ones which have either your uh, amine groups that can be protonated or deprotonated, um, the long chain amine here. And you can see it's this pKa of the side chain that makes it different. So um, the, the isoelectric point of arginine as just an amino acid is very basic. Same with lysine, very basic. 
Um, histidine is not as basic. It becomes it cha- it becomes protonated at a very low um, pH. So it's the pKa of the side chain that's important when you're talking about uh, proteins in chains. The pI here is is for the amino acid. Where in the protein chain, this would be joined to the next amino acid. This would be joined to the next amino acid. Same with aspartic acid and glutamic acid. So this animation shows you what is going to happen during that, where when you put these molecules into the gel strip or into uh, the isolate, the pH gradient, they can be spread all over the gradient. And then when we turn the voltage on, the numbers indicate the isoelectric point of those particular proteins. They migrate to their isoelectric point and they form a line at that isoelectric point. So again, laboring the point, um, here at this pH, the pH equals the isoelectric point. This is neutral. Um, and then you've got the pH below the isoelectric point or above the isoelectric point where above it becomes negative, below it becomes positive. Yeah. So, and this is another representation of that where you've got your uh, molecules spread out across the gradient at the start and then you focus them independent of the size. So the size of these balls indicates the size of the protein. So you've got large proteins and small proteins and they've all got the same isoelectric point. And so that you can do this in a tube gel or in a, um, a column of liquid with a thing called amphalites to be able to focus in liquid. We'll come back to that in a second. But it's far easier and far more reproducible to do this in what's called an immobilized pH gradient, where you cast a gradient in onto a piece of plastic. So you can see here that there are individual bands, and this is the, this will be a certain pH where that band has, where that collection of proteins is focused to. Again, we're using these acrylamide derivatives and we're casting them with acrylamide and bisacrylamide into the gel matrix so that these either sulfonate groups or other groups that can be that have a certain pH can be cast into the matrix. And what we end up doing is we end up casting them as a gradient where one end of the strip will be pH 3, the other end of the strip will be pH 10. One of the cool things that you can do is you can have longer and longer strips which increase the resolving power, the distance apart that you can focus things, or you can start to use narrow pH gradients where you can focus um, where if you've got a strip of the same length but a shorter distance, you can separate out the proteins much greater. The only problem is that things that are outside the range of the strip, they end up focusing to the end of the strip and they just pre- typically precipitate out. And I'll show you an image of this um, in a few slides. Um, it, it doesn't look good and it's not very helpful. Um, solubilizing proteins for IEF um, is very, very important. And so we can't use SDS and we can't use anything conductive um, because that will affect the focusing of the proteins. The focusing is done at anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 volts at sub micro amp amounts of current. If you've got too much current, you'll start, you'll, uh, you'll start fires um, and burning strips do not focus very well. So, what we do is we need to use kaotropes, typically urea and thiourea, to keep the protein soluble because the proteins become very insoluble at their isoelectric point and they are prone to uh, falling out of solution and precipitating in the strip, which is not very good because then we can't get them back out. The other thing that we want to do, we can use to enhance solubility is surfactants. So we talked about SDS before for SDS page. We need to use what are called Zwitter ionic surfactants, um, where you have a positive group and a negative group, so that these can act as surfactants where you've got 
this very large hydrophobic region that can interact with the protein and then these charged regions that can interact with the water uh, environment around the protein but the overall charge on this is neutral. So this can interact ionically with the water environment, this can interact ionically with the water environment in, in a different way, but the overall charge on this molecule is zero. So it it's bound to the protein, but it's not affecting the migration of the protein in the electric field. Um, that migration is being affected by the amino acids on the protein. This is CHAPS. This is one of the most typical um, surfactants used in isoelectric focusing at about 4%. Not the most powerful surfactant. Things like this molecule here, C7BZO, um, you can use this with equal solubilizing power at about 1%. And the less surfactant that you, that you can have in there, the better your focusing is going to be because you're not forming weird micelles. How do you get proteins into IPG strips? There's a couple of ways where um, the first one is to use what's called passive loading, where you pipet your um, strip, uh, you pipet your sample onto the bottom of a tray, and you the strip, the IPG strip comes dry, and you take the backing paper off and you put it down, and the liquid rehydrates, it soaks into the polyacrylamide and um, and rehydrates it. And then you can put it into the machine with the electrodes on and focus uh, through here. You normally do this under oil. The other way of doing it is that you partially rehydrate the IPG strip with kaotropes, surfactants and water. And then you add this little cup on the top and you pipette your sample into here, and when you turn the voltage on, the proteins get pulled out of here and then focused into the strip. One other way of doing it is to do this thing called active loading, where you assemble the strip with the, uh, the strip upside down in the tray, and you pipette the sample underneath the strip and when you turn the voltage on, it gets drawn into the strip, a lot like how the proteins get drawn out of the cup and into the strip. So what we typically do is we don't do isoelectric focusing alone. We interface uh, isoelectric focusing with SDS page. So we do our first dimension where we focus by charge. And then we take that strip and we soak it in the solution of SDS so that we make these focused proteins now negative. And then we put the strip on top of a SDS page gel and all of these are now negatively charged and they get pulled through the gel um, by their size. And so you end up with an image like this, where each one of these spots should be a single protein isoform. What they probably are is all of the, iso all of the molecules that have the same isoelectric point and the same mass. And this can happen. You can have a proteoform where it has the same amino acid composition in a different order, which will give it a different function, but having two different proteins of the same composition, but the amino acids in a different order, they're still going to have the same isoelectric point and the same mass. So they will migrate to the same place in these 2D gels. Um, but you can see the separation is relatively powerful. We can now cut these individual spots out. Um, and in proteomics, we would ingel trips and digest them and put them through uh, the mass spectrometer. This is an example from my PhD thesis where you can see that this has been done where various protein spots have been cut out. They've been identified and you can see the identification of some of these proteins. Um, You've got to be careful with your samples, um, and this is why we need to fractionate things. This is what happens if you load plasma. Um, you see, this is all albumin. These are the heavy chain of immunoglobulin. Even when you try and do some depletion or you reduce the amount of protein loaded, you still get this massive albumin smear here. So what you would then need to do is do some form of fractionation before you ran these uh, samples on the gel. So you've got to be careful with things like this. 
You can increase your resolution, as I mentioned before, in 2D. This is a sample that's been separated out on a 3 to 10 gradient and then on uh, the second dimension. If you run these on narrow range strips of the same length, you can start to resolve things out into a much wider area. So I'm going to show you this on... Uh, whoops, no, sorry, I must have taken that slide out. We'll talk about it again here. Yeah, where you can you, you can see that there's probably, you know, there's a smear of 10 or 12 spots here. They resolve out into a much, much higher amount of spots. The only problem with this is that it needs more sample, and rather than running one gel, you're running three gels. Um, so it really does come down to what you are trying to achieve in the experiment. So what we can... what electrophoresis is really, really good for is actually resolving proteoforms. So this is a particular part of a gel um, where we're looking at just the part between 55 and 43 kilodaltons. We've separated out by 3 to 10 and we've got all of these spots. And what I've highlighted here is these particular spots all come from the same open reading frame. So if we were to do this by shotgun proteomics, and we talked a little bit about this during the mass spectrometry lectures, we'll talk about it in the proteomics lecture, um, which is coming after this, we would, uh, we would get peptides spanning this entire open reading frame, and we wouldn't realize that there is multiple proteoforms. But what's actually happening is that this open reading frame is being translated into one really big um, pre-protein, which is then getting, getting proteolytically cleaved into at least three different proteoforms, different mature proteoforms. And even then, you've got ones like here, where these two spots are both this proteoform, but there's some kind of post-translational modification that's occurring that's making one of them more acidic. Um, it could be phosphorylation. It could be some, it could be an amino acid substitution. We're not sure. Um, same with with these two, where you've got three different proteoforms, four different proteoforms, five different proteoforms for this region here, where there's different post-translational modifications causing three different protea five different proteoforms here. And so um, what we're showing here is the difference between doing a 2D gel and a 1D gel because all of those proteoforms, if we just do it by SDS page, are going to be in this region here. So you can see that there's like oh, 10 or so bands in here, but you can, you can see that at exactly the same mass, there's already one, two, three, four, five. All of these bands would all migrate together in SDS page. Um, and all of these would be together in uh, LCMS. I'm going to move on now to native electrophoresis. What we've talked about up to this point has been all denaturing everything out and, and reducing things to single isolated proteoforms where we don't have any kind of complexes or interactions. But we know that the majority of proteins either function as protein complexes, they interact with other proteins to exert their function, or they bind to DNA, they bind to RNA to do various things. So we really want to characterize these interactions. Now, preserving those interactions can be difficult. We did talk a little bit, and I will talk about in the proteomics lecture, about um, cross-linking. Um, but we really want to look at these things um, from a native point of view. These interactions are typically labile, and they're easily disrupted when you take the protein or the complex out of its native environment. We can't use strong detergents because that's going to disrupt the interaction and force things apart. And the other thing is these things can be really big. Um, so we need to uh, separate these things out using high resolution techniques that work on large molecules. So this is a very challenging area. The main way that we do this with electrophoresis is we use either the these uh, native systems. Now, if we did completely native page, which is in this column here, all we're doing is extracting at neutral pH. 
we're probably not using any kind of detergents and therefore the proteins are going to migrate through the gel based on their intrinsic charge. So at 7.5, some of them may be positive, some of them may be negative, some of them may be neutral. And so some things won't enter the gel at all. Um, they will either sit in the well or they'll go in the opposite direction because that's where the, the electrode they want to go to is. Some of them will move into the gel. Their migration distance doesn't just depend on their size because they've all got different charges. They will move at different rates. So this, while it works, it's not brilliant. The thing that we normally do is we actually coat proteins with something that won't denature but gives a uniform negative charge. So the two molecules that are typically used is Kumasi, this molecule down here, which has the sulfonate groups on here. Um, so it doesn't denature the complex, it just sticks to the outside and gives it a negative charge, or deoxycholate, um, which will give a negative charge to the proteins as well. And now we can separate those complexes by size. And so when you do this, it, it looks a little bit like this where you've got large complexes at the top of the gel, and as you go down, these things get smaller and smaller. So here's a, a hexamer of a particular complex, and then you've got um, monomers and dimers of the same hexamer. Um, different surfactants cause slight differences in the migration or the extraction. So you would normally try a number of different detergents or a number of different surfactants to get this to work. You can also do this in two dimensions where, in this particular case, this is uh, Streptococcus, um, where in the first dimension along here, we're separating by complex size, and then I've soaked this in SDS, put it on top of another gel, and separated them by, uh, uh, by the components of the complex. So this is probably best illustrated over here, where anything that is in the same straight line was in a particular complex. So you can see there's some large, really large complexes of just one protein or you know, a couple of other handful of proteins that are in there. This here is glutamate synthetase. This all came from this, which was about, I don't know, 300, 400 kilodaltons, whereas this, band, this marker here is 75. So um, again, these things, the, these three proteins here, they would have all been in the same complex that came from here. So you can look at, separate things by complex size and then separate them by subunit and work out what was in a particular complex. Now, all the images that I've shown you up to now where you've, you can actually visualize these protein bands have required some kind of staining. Biomolecules, normally are not colored. You normally cannot see them in the gel. So if you run your gel, all you're going to see is something clear. You need to stain them with something to be able to visualize them. And this goes with DNA as well. So typically for proteins, we use things like Kumasi, which goes this blue color when you see it with proteins and it's a visible stain. You can see it with your eye. But for more sensitivity, you can use fluorescent stains. And so with DNA, we typically use a thing called ethidium bromide, which will uh, fluoresce under UV light. Um, with proteins, Kamasi will fluoresce uh, under infrared light. Um, and then you've got things like Cypro Ruby and Flamingo. So there's a load of these things for proteins, and there's just a, a showing you some of the structures of these things. Um, and if you're clever enough with your physics and your chemistry, you'll understand why some of these things actually do fluoresce. You can do multiplexed fluorescing, uh, fluorescence where you can take a gel and you can stain it with one dye with one stain that in this case is staining for phosphoproteins. So everywhere you see a blue spot, that's a phosphoprotein. You can then and when you would image this gel after staining with the phosphoprotein with the with this stain, you would only see the phosphoproteins. You wouldn't see the rest. You then after you image it, go back and stain again with Cypro, which stains 
everything and now you can see the entire gel. Now this thing has been pseudo colored to see the difference um, where you tell the software, okay, whatever fluoresced at this wavelength, make it blue, whatever fluoresced at this wavelength, make it red. So you can distinguish the two of them. Um, and you can multiplex these as, as much as you want with, um, depending on how many lasers you've got and how many different dyes and whether they separate out enough in the fluorescence range. Last things I'm going to talk about is um, about how to get proteins out of gels because it's really great to be able to separate and fractionate these things, but what if you want to get them back? Um, so gels are really good cages for holding proteins and for the staining that we've shown before, you would normally fix things in the gel with methanol and acetic acid, which means that they won't diffuse out of the gel easily. Um, if you wanted to get stuff out, you need to do it before fixation. So you can do things like passive or in this case, electroelution, where you can get devices where you put the gel on top, um, you have electrodes and paper, and you pass a current through here, which extracts the protein out of the gel and then puts them into a well where they're collected. Um, if um, your gels are fixed, the only way that you can get proteins out is by trips and digesting and making peptides and diffusing the peptides out. Passive evolution, basically you cut the piece of the gel out that you want before it has been stained. So you need some prior knowledge as to where your protein's going to be. And then you put it into a solution and just wait. Wait for the protein to diffuse out into the surrounding liquid. The most common way of getting proteins out of gels and analyzing them is to do what's called a Western blot. And so what we do is we run our gel, we don't fix it, and then we put it into a stack here where we have our gel and then we have a membrane of either nitrocellulose or uh, PVDF. And we then put a current through here so that the, the uh, molecules of the protein molecules, you could do this for DNA as well, you can do it for RNA, where you pull them out of the gel and onto the membrane and they stick to the membrane. They won't go through. Um, you can then, you can stain those with things like Kumasi or um, Amido, uh, sorry, uh, Amido Black um, or Ponso Red to be able to see them and then cut them out if you really want. But the most common thing to do is then to uh, do an immunoblot where the protein is on the surface of the blot. You block the rest of the membrane with something like BSA or skim milk powder that won't react with your antibodies. You um, then probe with an antibody that's specific to your protein which is either labeled or you use a secondary antibody that is conjugated to some kind of detection mechanism. Could be fluorescence, it could be an enzyme such as alkaline phosphatase or horseradish peroxidase, um, which when you then add a colorimetric reagent, you get a reaction that creates a product. So here's an example where we've got a healer cell lysate and we're doing a dilution series of the HeLa cell. This is showing the Kamasi image where this is showing the total protein in the sample. These are the same samples, but they've been probed with an antibody specific for CDK7. And then we've done chemiluminescent detection where the antibody would have um, horseradish peroxidase put on it, and then you're adding uh, a peroxidase substrate, um, which in solution it is colorless, but when the, the horseradish peroxidase cleaves it, it becomes a brown insoluble precipitate where the antibody was. So this is showing you in this complex mixture, CDK7 occurs at this point. There's a little bit of cross reaction with something else. It may be proteoforms or something like that. Um, but you can use this to look in a complex mixture quite easily. Is my specific protein in there and what abundance is it in there for? So that brings me to the end of the lecture, uh, 54 minutes later. And hopefully what you've got out of this is 
Electrophoresis is an important technique. It is extensively used. I've mainly focused on its research purposes, but it is also used in some clinical assays. Um, and so it's important to understand how these things work. The success of electrophoresis is very much dependent, yet again, on good sample preparation, removing things that are not necessary to be there, lipids, excessive amounts of salt, depending on what kind of thing you're trying to do. And the last thing I, that we talked about was doing multidimensional separations where we separate by one property, say charge, and then another property, size, to increase the resolution and to increase the amount of information that you're seeing. A lot of this will now be expanded upon in the next video that we do, which is all about proteomics.